PPM. I don't know, that bio always makes me hungry. Anyway, so total parenteral nutrition. And we'll talk about that. That is basically providing a patient's total nutritional and fluid needs, everything they need for a day supply when we do these calculations, via an IV. So I always like to pick the middle that shows the Thanksgiving turkey here. Everything it comes through the IV. It doesn't taste as good because you can't taste anything, right? So why would anyone need to get all of their, and again, I like this kind of picture on top that shows you. Think about your food. I mean, on a daily basis, what do you eat? You eat protein, you eat carbohydrates, you eat fat. All of those nutritional things you normally get orally, we're going to have to provide into this TPN bag. So basically, the plants all the nutrition and give it intravenously. Why would you do that? Well, picture a hospital. A lot of people go into hospitals and they have gastrointestinal issues. Maybe it's cancer. Maybe it's inflammatory bowel disease. Maybe it was a horrific auto accident or something that's caused some trauma, damage. They need to go in there surgically and do some manipulation, resection, repair, whatever it is, right? They stitch it all back up together, and then you need to recover. What's the worst thing you can do after major GI surgery is to put food through there, right? We need to let that heal and recover and, and regenerate before we start putting food back through the system. So typically, that's why most people need PPMs for short term. Short term maybe being several days, three days, a week, maybe two weeks at the most, to allow recover from surgery. So they can start putting things back into their mouth and taking things by the mouth. So that's most of it. And that's what we'll do in the lab today. We're going to be talking about some patients who have short term PPN. There are. I mean, if they have to go in due to cancer or some other reason and resect a large portion of the bowel, whether it's the small intestines or large intestines, you might have to be on a TPN long, much longer term. But that is not quite the norm for that. Day. So we'll focus on what you'll see mainly in your hospital rotations and so forth, which are these short term TPNs. Due to recovery or trauma due to some reason. Okay? So that's why somebody's going to have to do it. We're going to really, this is not a therapeutics lecture. We're going to practice the calculations. You're going to have to formulate and come up with volumes of liquids to add, right? So this is kind of more in the inpatient pharmacy that we would do that. But since it's kind of an academic situation, I want to show you a quick video that reminds you when I talk about amino acids, it's a bottle, it's a liquid, and you're going to mix that with another liquid. And the fat emulsion looks like milk because it's fat, it's not liquid. So, and where do all of these actual companies occur? in a clean room, in a hospital, and again, in a laminar flow hood. And even when we talk about the automated compounding devices, the pumps here you'll see in a minute, those are in the hood that are in the clean room. So it's the whole sterile products UFP 797 is an important part of the preparation for that. So we'll focus on the calculation, but just a quick little review of some of the main base solutions and kind of the environment these compounding is occurring. PN refers to IV administration of the nutrients needed to sustain life. TPNs contain carbohydrates, proteins, fats, water, electrolytes, vitamins, trace elements, and may also include such drugs as heparin. TPN solutions contain base components and additives. Base components are usually mixed first and make up much of the volume of the TPN. These solutions are generally administered by a pump to maximize safety. TPN therapy is indicated for patients who cannot meet their nutritional needs through oral or other gastrointestinal means. TPNs may be used for patients who cannot, will not, or should not eat, or who cannot absorb enough nutrients to sustain their needs. Procedures for oral TPN solutions are ordered specifically to meet a patient's metabolic and nutritional needs. An order for central TPN solution might look like this. The preparation of TPN solutions has changed considerably in the past several years. In the past, many of the components had to be prepared from non-sterile powders. Today, most TPN ingredients are available as sterile solutions made by gravity fill or by means of an automated compounding device. First, let's look at the gravity fill method. As the name implies, gravity fill uses gravity to transfer the base components into the final container. While gravity fill uses equipment that is normally part of an IV program, the disadvantages of this method are that it limits flexibility in the volumes of base components used. It takes longer than automated methods, and volumes cannot usually be measured accurately. Let's have a look at the two gravity fill methods for filling bags, the empty bag method and the underfill method. The empty bag method involves starting with an empty sterile bag that will be used as the final container. Commercially available bags have leads that can be connected to bottles or bags containing the base components. This method can be used for either traditional or three-in-one preparations. Another method is the underfill method. This method uses commercially available underfilled bags, which are partially filled with concentrated dextrose solution. 
a bottle of amino acids is connected to the underfilled bag by a tubing set and infused into the partially filled bag. With either method, other components are added by injecting them through an injection port into the final container. This is usually the final step before labeling and dispensing. Take great care, both in technique and accuracy, since the potential for errors is high and their ramifications are serious. Each additive must be in the correct amount. If even one is incorrect, the entire solution must be remade. The pharmacist must check each step. We will now talk about automated compounding devices. Automated compounding devices, or ACDs, are specialized equipment used to prepare the TPN solution. Two primary versions of TPN compounders are available. One version provides a separate compounder for the base solutions and for the electrolytes, while the other version uses one compounder to infuse all the compounded ingredients. In the former, three primary pieces of equipment are used, sometimes together and sometimes individually. For example, one computer-controlled ACD prepares the base components, dextrose, amino acids, and possibly fat emulsion and water, while a second networked ACD adds most or all of the additives or other components. The base ACD uses special tubing that can withstand the pumping action of the machine and allocating large volumes of solutions. It accounts for the specific gravity of the solutions being used and weighs the amount pumped into the final container. The final preparations are checked by comparing the anticipated final weight of the preparation against the actual final weight of the preparation. Variances of more than plus or minus 3% are not accepted. The accuracy provided by the ACDs cannot totally substitute for all checks in ensuring the quality of the preparation. Additional safeguards must be built into each step of the TPN ordering, preparation, and administration process. Calculations should be verified, and solutions and their ingredients should be double-checked, regardless of the system used. ACDs are used inside the laminar airflow workbench and must be cleaned daily according to the manufacturer's instructions. These systems require routine maintenance and calibration to ensure accurate compounding. To minimize the potential for errors, the compounder should be observed during operation. Quality control procedures may be implemented to verify final contents of the preparation. Now, let's look at the administration of TPN solutions. Most TPN solutions are made for administration through a central line. This route is used because it results in immediate dilution and high concentration. Administering 2,000 to 3,000 milliliters of concentrated TPN solution can allow a medical team to completely meet an adult patient's daily nutritional needs. Occasionally, parenteral nutrition is administered through a peripheral IV line. Peripheral parenteral nutrition, or PPN, can contain many of the same components as TPN. However, to be administered peripherally, the PPN admixture may not be as concentrated or have as high an osmolarity as TPN. Since these solutions are less concentrated, they may not meet the patient's total nutritional needs. All right, well, thanks for that. We kind of put a visual to the things we're going to do here in a little bit. So let's go through the main building blocks just to make sure. When we think about our formulation here, one of the main things, the first things we're going to calculate is the total daily fluid being, right? I look around here and I see some water bottles. Why are you guys drinking? You want to keep hydrated, right? We don't want to become dehydrated. So one of the things we got to provide in our PPM, I may not think of it as nutritional, but it's water, it's hydration. So it's got to be an important calculation. We want to get it right. If we don't hydrate enough, if we don't give enough fluid, they become dehydrated. That's a big deal because they lose blood volume. If you lose blood volume, you don't perfuse your organs, your heart, your brain, other things too. It doesn't get enough blood, enough oxygen. Things go south really quickly. So again, we want to make sure we have enough fluid to give the blood. We don't want to overestimate on the other side either because if you stick too much fluid in, water tends to leak out in places you don't want it leaking out, around the lungs, around the periphery, and something else. So we want a good estimate of the total amount of fluid they need per day to keep the blood volume adequate. So we'll be doing water, hydration. Another big component is protein. I'll say protein. And just so we're clear, what is the IV component that provides the protein is amino acids. So the amino acids will be the actual thing we give to provide protein, but protein is a huge part. And this was to know, the patients in a hospital in ETPN need a lot of protein because protein is used for tissue regrowth and regeneration. Remember how we talked about surgery and trauma. Think about a burn patient that has to replace skin all over their body and so forth. They are growing a lot of tissue. Protein is essential in that function. 
So you'll see here in a little bit, the amount of protein we're going to estimate a patient will be depending on how sick they are, how much tissue damage and trauma they've experienced. The more of that they need, the more of the protein they need. So we'll estimate it on that. We want the protein there for that reason. However, can protein be broken down into caloric and used for calories and energy? Absolutely. And again, it gives you four kilocalories of energy per gram of protein. We don't want the body to use it. That's why we're going to provide most of the calories and other sources, but we can't prevent the body from doing whatever it's going to do with the protein. So we will account for it. So when we're going to give protein for the tissues in the body, we're going to assume, though, that there will be energy provided by that protein as well. So we'll factor that into the caloric requirement. But we're going to try to minimize what the body uses the proteins for calories because we're going to provide most of the caloric needs through two main sources. The first of which is carbohydrates, right? So carbohydrates, think of it as very clean burning energy. So we're going to try to provide the majority, not all of the calories, but the majority of the calories through carbohydrates. Okay? What limits the amount of carbohydrates we can use? Well, obviously we don't want to overwhelm the body's ability to maintain it in the blood in terms of hyperglycemia. We don't want to cause hyperglycemia and exceed the ability, body's ability to secrete insulin to manage it from the blood. But it turns out that's really not the problem. Because unlike that age where you get the postprandial spikes, the CPN is infused consistently all day. So you don't have as much of the hyperglycemia issues as you have the total load. We don't want to overload the body's ability to deal with that glucose. So are you aware that there's another very important organ in the glucose regulation of the body? And that's the liver. Don't forget about your liver. It forms new glucose. That's why you don't die. If you don't eat at all, I've never tried this, but if you don't eat all day, you don't die because your liver dumps out a bunch of glucose, right? It also stores up a bunch of the extra glucose in the form of glycogen. So what we're going to end up doing in our calculations is you'll see that there's this number, 7.2 grams per kilogram per day. That's the numeric limit the liver can handle. You don't want to put in more carbohydrates in the form of dextrose than the liver can handle. So that's a number we'll use in our calculations to represent that. Okay? So when I keep saying about carbohydrates, the form when you think about glucose, but the form that we put in the IV, remember how we said amino acids are our protein, our carbohydrate in the, in the um, PPM will be dextrose, just a dextro-rotary form of glucose. So it's a type of glucose, but a different form of glucose. But we will be giving dextrose to give us a lot of our energy. However, not all of it. And when we get the remainder, will be from fat. Okay, and fats, you'll notice, are actually a very, a very potent source. I didn't say this, but the dextrose provides 3.4 kilocalories per gram. Look at fat. That's why you want to be on a low-fat diet, right? Because it doesn't take a lot of fat to provide a lot of calories. You get 10 kilocalories per gram from fat. So it's a very efficient way of giving calories. And again, fats are important for hormones. A lot of your corticosteroids are based on, on fat molecules. Platelets and blood coagulation involves with fat. So we want to have a little bit of fat to provide the building blocks for that. So what we don't get from carbohydrates in the form of dextrose, we will get from fat in the form of fat emulsion. It's actually called fat emulsion. And it looks like milk. And so it's a little bit different. You can always tell if the PPN has fat emulsion in it because it looks white and milk. So, so far so good. That's the core components. When we talk about macronutrients versus micronutrients, macronutrients are base solutions are what we talk about. We talk about water, amino acid, dextrose, and fat emulsion. That provides the bulk of the calories in the water. Now, though, the, a lot of the other ingredients are micronutrients because, again, you hopefully you understand sodium, potassium, uh, calcium, phosphate, there, magnesium. There's a lot of electrolytes that are clearly important for nerve conduction and other reasons. We lose those, whether it's through sweat or tears, if you're in pharmacy school or pee or wherever else, you lose them. So we need to replace those kind of on a daily basis. So that should be pretty straightforward. What's important to know, though, so the amounts most people need are the same, which makes those calculations kind of easy. But it turns out two of those electrolytes are problematic in the same bag, and that is the calcium from the calcium gluconate has issues with the phosphate and the potassium phosphate. So you can form a precipitate, actually, an actual solid, calcium phosphate. We can avoid that if we keep stay below this key concentration. So what you're going to do is perform a chalk test, which is you're going to add up the amount of milliequivalents of the calcium with milliequivalents of the phosphate. And so long as the combined total isn't more than 45 milliequivalents per liter, then it's unlikely to form that precipitate. Concentrations above that combined total puts you at risk for having that precipitate form. So we're going to perform that test to make sure our PPNs don't exceed those two concentrations, or that concentration for the combination. All right, that's the electrolytes, that's the majority of it. So just a little other kind of things we throw in there include multiple vitamins, right? You need your vitamins and minerals. So vitamins are kind of easy. It comes as pre-formulated injection called MVI, multiple vitamin for injection. 
the 10 milliliter dose. So you just suck a 10 milliliter of MBI, stick it in the back. Vitamin. Mineral is in the form of trace elements. It's three milliliters of an additive called trace elements, and it all, has all the minerals in it. We'll add that for a daily amount. So again, vitamins and minerals, three mils plus 10 mils gives you about 13 mils of fluid that you add to each bag to provide vitamins and minerals. And that's pretty much it. That's where we're going to certainly stop in our calculation. But be aware, there are times other things go in there. There are sometimes you'll see insulin added to a PGN, not often. Sometimes you'll see, uh, again, if you're on long term, when we talk about multiple vitamins, one of the vitamins that's not in there is vitamin K. So you, are you aware of vitamin K and its role in blood coagulation and think of warfarin and all that? So if somebody is on a long term PPM, you put in vitamin K every month or so. So you might add that. The other thing you'll sometimes see added is think about that. If you're not eating anything for several days, what is all the acid doing in your stomach? It just sits there, right? It may cause some stomach irritation and upset. So sometimes you'll see PPMs where they'll add the H2 antagonist or they'll add a proton pump inhibitor simply to help keep the acid out of the stomach since there's some, nothing there to bind it out. So there are some other things you can add to PPMs, but they're not necessarily there for the nutritional aspect of it. Okay, so we won't worry about that anymore. Okay. Lastly, well, we get going. This was covered in the video, but it's super important. So we're going to talk, we're going to start off with a three in one. So a three in one means everything, the fat, the lipids, uh, I'm sorry, the fat and the dextrose and the amino acids and all everything gets in one bag. You make one bag per day. That's when you see these ginormous two to three liter bags that last all day and provide everything. Will we have to perform isotonicity calculations? Do we need to make this isotonic? There's no way. Everything this person needs is in the same solution. So it's a super hypertonic solution. Again, where you're talking about possibility of 600 or more, it can be 900 to 1200. Remember, normal is about 280 to 300. So what do they talk about in the video? TPNs with all of this hyperosmolar solution needs to be administered in a special way. It can only go in through a what? Central line. So whether it's a peripherally inserted central line, which is a pick, or just a normal central line, then so what's the point of a central line? Make sure you know that in general. The end of that catheter ends where? In the superior vena cable, which is the largest blood vessel in the body with the highest blood flow as the heart blood is going back to the heart. So it will dilute that solution as quickly as possible and minimize any problems. Okay? So again, we're assuming in all our calculations here for our TPMs. We're going to ignore all of the hypertensity issues and just administer it via a central line. Okay. Set the stage. Let's get into our calculations now and start performing it for a patient. So get out your worksheet. When I say get out, I know it's flipped to a different tab, but you're going to want it right in your PDF. Start writing this information down. I want to fill out the top line. Now, I'm not going to always flip back and forth to this, but for what I mean right now, as I read through our little scenario here in a minute, we're going to start with this pre-step, which is everything above the line here. So age, gender, and then we'll come down to feed weight. So we'll start filling that part of the format. So do your, I hope that you're doing that as I'm talking. So let's fill out the blocks here a little bit, because we're going to start off. Our patient is a 64-year-old male who weighs actual body weight. So ABW, actual body weight is 95 kilograms and stands in height of 5 feet 9 inches. So the first thing on your sheet as well, let's go ahead and calculate the height in centimeters. You're going to need that height in centimeters. So take five feet, nine inches, convert that to centimeters. I always do that by going to inches and remembering that there are 2.54 centimeters per inch. So 2.54 centimeters per inch. Calculate this patient's height in centimeters. And on the row below that, don't go ahead of me yet, but you can write down the ABW. I gave you the actual body weight was 95 pounds. Second to do that. Again, sometimes I will put the numbers or the answers on my slides, but do the calculations. There's nothing more boring than just listening to me, so they can do the calculations so that you're practicing. I will tell you now, the calculations today are not hard. They're easy math, but we do this specifically for you guys. You're about to hit rotations, and it's been a while since you've done much math calculation type stuff. So it's to get you back on the calculators and being precise. It isn't difficult, but you don't want to make numeric errors or simple errors when you're doing these calculations. It matters. We're doing the direct patient care when you do these types of formulations. So did you get 175 centimeters? Hopefully you got 175 centimeters. So going on a little bit just so that why is our patient in the hospital? He's here for a bowel reception. So he had some trauma or some issue with his bowel. So they did surgery on him, and now he's recovering. They sewn it all back together. We want to let him rest. Don't want him to be NPO or nothing by now for at least several days. So we're going to continue to feed him by the time. Okay. 
All right, now uh, let's look on the form because what we're leading up to, to see the big box there that says speed weight. We need a feed weight. The feed weight will be the weight we base all of the other calculations on as we go forward. Okay, but there's a couple of things you need to consider to come up with the right feed weight. So go ahead and use the formulas on that worksheet and calculate this ideal body weight. Make sure you're careful with the ideal body weight. It is different by gender, so use the correct gender formula. Once you get the ideal body weight, multiply by 1.2, which sets a 20% over that value. So I want to know 120% of the ideal body weight. Just multiply your ideal body weight by 1.2. And then for now, go ahead and calculate an adjusted body weight. I give you the formula there, but you have to know the ideal body weight to calculate it. So calculate the ideal, 120% of ideal, and adjust it. And then stop, and we'll talk about what to do with those weights here in a little bit. One thing I'll comment on as some of you are still working is if you look at my adjusted body weight formula that I'm having you use here, it takes the difference between the actual ideal and multiplied by what? 0.25. That's a little different than you may have used in the past. When you do like real dosing for adjusted body weight sometimes and in other applications, often I've seen 0.4. The reason for this is for that we're doing particularly nutritional calculations now. We're trying to do it for a feed weight. So we don't want, there's a tendency to not overfeed. You'll see why we're using this here in a little bit. We don't want to feed, overfeed them. So this number is specifically reduced a little bit. So it is kind of a variation of the adjusted body weight. So that number is a little bit different than you may have seen or used in other contexts. So why are we doing all of this? Because we've got to take and feed this person. His weight is going to determine all of his calories are and everything else. So everyone look at me real quick. You can do this. I don't know how well it shows up on the video. You, bet you guys know me a little bit. Is every part of my body metabolically active? Is it bones and muscle and organs and brain? And sadly, not so much on the brain, but you know, or is there part of a lot of people that sometimes don't actually do anything and contribute and need calories? What am I getting at? What do we want to feed? We don't want to feed fat. So we want to find a way for a person that includes their muscles, bones, and organs, but not their fat. So in some people, there's some fat. And so what are some ways we can use? Ideal body weight. What is an ideal body weight? Have you ever calculated your own ideal body weight? It's depressing sometimes because it's a pretty low weight, right? It says that's supposed to be a lean weight, which estimates really with not any excess fat. Okay? But it's not always super accurate either because some people can have extra muscle mass instead of fat. So sometimes that weight isn't exactly correct either. So here's our best estimate. So we're going to take this and we're going to say, okay, there's less than ideal. Ideal to 120% of ideal and over 120% of ideal. We're going to take this person's actual body weight and are you below ideal within that range of 100 to 120% or are you above 120%? If you are less than ideal, then we would use your actual body weight, right? Unless, here's the deal, some people are on TPN because they've had a long exposure to some gastrointestinal issue or they may have been in a malnourished state for some time because of that. If somebody is underweight because they're malnourished, do we want to keep them malnourished? No, oh, we might go up higher and go towards ideal body weight if that's the reason. But if that's their normal weight, they are just historically at that weight, then we use their actual body weight. If they're between ideal and 120% of ideal, then you can kind of use their actual body weight as well because you're feeding their normal, normal weight. The issue comes when you're over 120% of ideal, then there's weight there that's considered fat that we don't want to feed. That's where you would tend to use the adjusted body weight. Okay, so for this guy, is he below ideal? No. Is he an ideal to 120%? No. His 95 is above the upper limit of 85, so let's use the adjusted body weight. The adjusted body weight is just something, not all the way down to ideal, but that's 25% over that. So in that sense, let's use 77. I guess I didn't read my numbers here. Oh, I read Did you guys just check your calculations? Did you get 71 for ideal body weight? And then we can round a little bit different. I don't worry about rounding the issue. 85 was my 120%. They should have done this. But his 95, therefore, is over that. So let's use the 77 that I calculated for the adjusted body weight. So under fee weight, this is big, but 77. So from here on out, when we do a calculation based off of weight, what weight are we going to use? The feed weight or the 77 kilograms. So that's why it was an important step going forward. Okay? All right, to finish up this kind of pre step on your worksheet, uh, before we jump into the actual calculation, I'm still ask. Well, if I'm going to dump a bunch of fluid into this person, can he get the fluid out? Where does a lot of the fluid come out of? The kidneys through the urine. So you're going to want to check renal function. So you could look at a serum creatinine, calculate a creatinine clearance, and again, if it's severely limited, if they have reduced renal function, then you may have to reduce the total volume of the fluid. 
you may need to do some sodium restriction as well. So we wanted to consider the renal function. That could clinically play a role in some adjustments. So for this patient, we're going to say that the serum creatinine is normal, so we don't need to calculate a creatinine clearance. But, and we're going to simplify our patients. But I'm just going to kind of emphasize here that there are always patient-specific factors that can make adjustments when you get out there in the real world. So renal function is certainly one. But our guy is okay. Here's one you may not have thought of. It's not obvious. Albumin. You know what albumin is? It's a protein, right? That circulates a lot into the blood. It's a, one of the largest concentration of proteins in the blood. Comes from the liver, right? So it plays a big role for TPNs in the sense that since it is a major protein found in the blood, it's a big part of what causes the isotonicity in the blood. So if you have a reduction in that protein and you lose that oncotic pressure, what does your water tend to do? Leak out. So if you dump a bunch of fluid in via the TPN with somebody with a low albumin, you might get pleural edema where they're having a hard time oxygenating because of the fluid in the lungs, you have some peripheral edema. So you might need to do some fluid restriction in cases where there's a significant reduction in the amount of albumin. Our patient, that's not a problem, but it is a consideration. But here's something that does happen a little more often. The albumin actually can affect a lot of carrier molecules. Would you agree a lot of things are bound to albumin in the blood? What affects us with TPNs is calcium, right? Calcium is a super important electrolyte. We need to keep those concentrations, make it available for all those convection cells, cardiac cells, and so forth. It's bound to albumin. Well, if you don't have much albumin, then you have less bound calcium, right? Meaning you have more what? Unbound calcium. And it means there's more actual calcium available to the cells than it might appear on a lab sheet. Because if you just run a normal lab calcium, it's just a total of both bound or unbound. So if you don't have an ionized value, then you might need to calculate a corrected calcium in the situation where somebody has a low albumin just to ensure that you don't over replace the calcium. You don't want to overdo calcium because the low albumin means there's more free available anyway. So there are some issues with that. Our patient now, not a problem. Your patient that you're going to work on does have an issue we're going to deal with when we get to that. So just realize we will calculate that later. Not, not this patient. We're good for this. So serum albumin is normal. We don't have to worry about any adjustments to his calcium. So do we have everything we need now to actually start on the formulation? Yes. Okay. So just realize we're going to start with the macronutrients. And what will drive the macronutrient volumes will be how much fluid the patient needs, how much protein the patient needs, and what the overall calories we need to replace for this patient. So that's important. Now, focus on TPN. We're going to do fluids, protein, calories. All right? So let's do it. So number one on your worksheet. It's not difficult, but the first thing we got to do is determine this patient's total daily fluid needs. Most people need about the same amount of fluid every day. So let's estimate this by simply using the range of 25 milliliters to 35 milliliters per kilogram per day. So go ahead and multiply this value. Do your own math here, just practice it. Calculate the low end of the range, and then calculate the high end of the range, and then we'll talk about how to select from within that range. It's not difficult, but make sure you get my numbers. This is where I'm saying I'll put my numbers on the slide. Do your own math and make sure you kind of match my numbers. Remember to use the feed rate weight. We'll always be using the 77 kilogram feed rate. So on the low end, I got like 1,925 milliliters. On the high end, I got 2,695. Well, and just below that, I'll show you. There is that's one way. It's what I seem to be the most common way of estimating fluid. But there are other formulas as well. Is that like given there any alternate formula? So let's do this. So within our range of 1900 to 2700 about, if you will, let's choose a number. There's no right at all. Ah, but let's look at the patient. Are they fluid overloaded already? Look at their fluid status. I mean, if they've got just heart failure, if they've got some fluid already excess, then we are going to go low in that range. Uh, what about this? What if they're getting a bunch of IV fluid? I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But if they're getting fluid from other IVs in significant amounts, maybe we need to reduce the volume. Right? Because there's some clinical considerations you use to help choose within this range. Let's go in the middle-ish, but let's choose 2400. So right, and let's, when we all proceed together with our calculations with the same number, it's within the range, would you agree? So your answer for number one in the big box for calculated target for total daily fluid needs was the 2400 milliliters. And I would argue it's within the range, so not wrong. What about this? Why didn't we choose 2391? Well, that's a weird number, and I could go really wrong in my calculations. So why choose a weird, difficult number? So I chose a round number, right, in the middle of the range. 
And under 24 or something and something, you'll see that that may make it a little bit easier for a calculation later on. So you can choose convenient numbers as long as you're still clinically relevant. All right. That was it. That was the easiest one, but everyone got number one for daily fluid. Protein. When I say protein requirements, it's a little more difficult because, as I mentioned, the amount of protein somebody needs depends on their essential physiologic stress. All right. So a normal unstressed person, like you guys now, if you can consider pharmacy school being unstressed, would be 0 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. But you guys aren't in the hospital. So if you're in the hospital, it probably means you've got some degree of illness, repair, recovery going on there. So you're going to need a little more protein. So that's where the 1 to 1.2 is. Right? A stress patient really means severe trauma, God forbid, something like burns, something where there's a significant amount of damage that has to be healed and recovered from. So I would argue our person has came in and had some surgery and is now recovering. So let's put him in the hospitalized patient range. So anywhere from 1 to 1.2 grams per kilogram per day. So again, calculate the low end, calculate the high end, and we'll choose something in the middle. Right? Once again, there are some clinical considerations. How extensive was the surgery? How much was? That can be direct you how far within the range to go. But hopefully you've got 77 for the low end and 92 for the high end. And I just chose, let's choose 85 as a number, kind of round number in the middle. So for number two, your final answer for protein requirements in the big box should be 85 grams. Has chosen a number within the range of acceptable given his degree of clinical need. Okay, that was one step harder. Now we're going to go two steps harder because the caloric requirements are the most difficult. And only in the sense that there are two steps. So understand what we're doing right now is not the final answer, it's step one of two. Let me keep that in mind. We were going to just estimate how much calories this person needs for it. All right, so we're going to calculate the resting energy expenditure. And so what that is, if somebody just laid in bed, did not move, and did nothing but breathe and live, okay, that sounds like me on the weekend, but anyways, if that's all you do, then this is what we're calculating, the basic, the least amount of energy it would take to sustain a life, okay, so that's why it's not our final answer. There's just some formulas for estimating this. Have you ever heard of the Harris-Benedict? That's, they call that the basal energy expenditure, and that was used for a number of years. But they have found that that value tends to overestimate, so they are now saying that they think this newer equation, and it's kind of cool name, Midland St. Georg, I don't know if that's saying right, but this new equation is supposed to be a little more accurate in estimating this. So let's use that formula. So your next job now is to use the Midland St. Georg equation. Make sure you choose the correct gender. Or well, it could go wrong, right? Make sure you use the correct gender. Also, make sure you have the information in the right units. That's why you had to calculate the height in centimeters. So, and remember, some numbers are added together, some numbers are subtracted. So, this is a big part of today's lab. It's not hard, but can you accurately, with a somewhat complicated formula, get the right answer? So, do it on your own and calculate this patient's RPE, the resting energy expenditure. So, did you all get something close to 1,549 kilocalories? So let me clarify something about units here in a little bit. The correct units for what you're calculating are kcal. It stands for kilocalories, right? I'm going to say the word calories. It's the same thing. In this case, we are never switching from kilocalories to just regular calories or anything else. Our units will never change. So the true units are kilocalories. If I say calories, I mean kilocalories. So I'm not trying to go between those or anything else. So in this case, they need 1,549 kilocalories is not what they need. I should have said that. That is their resting energy expenditure. Okay. So now what we're going to do is fudge that. Okay, like we said, that's if you don't do anything but breathe. Most people are a little more active than that. So not only active, but again, the body's repairing and healing process uses energy to do that as well. So you'll notice here we need to multiply that value by a stress factor. The more stressed the person is, the more calories they need, the higher the value. Okay. So clearly, if they were perfectly healthy just staying in bed, you'd need 1.2 as the stress factor. But Having had some surgery, 1.3. If you had a significant trauma accident, think about sepsis, went all the way up to burn. So again, the more repairing and healing you need, the more energy you need, the higher the stress factor. Let's use 1.3 for this individual. I would argue they did just have some surgery, so we need to have a little bit of extra calories to kind of help with that repair and regeneration process. So let's take their REE of 1549, multiply that by 1.3, and get then what our target will be for their total daily energy expenditure, the BDE. -E. Our caloric target for this individual would be 2014 per
per day. Okay. Think about that. Is that even a reasonable number? If you think about product labeling, when you look at the nutritional facts for percentages and so forth, do you remember how many calories per day that's estimated on? Is it 2,000? So, I mean, this should be reasonable. Most people, I mean, that's an average is 2,000. Some people don't need 2,000. Some people need more than 2,000. So, the numbers you're calculating here really are the calories somebody needs in a day. So, we got to make it for this person. Our target would be 2,014. So, do we have targets one, two, and three? Okay, so now calories. It's going to be more complicated for calories. So, the whole thing about macronutrient calories steps four through seven, if you will, on your worksheet has to take this caloric target and get more specific, right? Because okay, calories will come from protein and carbohydrates and from fat. So we need to kind of subdivide these here a little bit. So number four on your worksheet says simply this. Okay, we don't want them to use protein for calories, but they can. So how many calories will come from the amount of protein we're going to give this patient? What did we decide? What was our target for protein? What was number two? Our target for protein was what, 85 grams? So, how many calories can come in that? So, let's take 85 grams times just the normal standard factor we know for protein. Protein provides 4 kilocalories per gram. So, if we take 85 times the 4 kilocalories per gram, what do you get? Because that would be the number of calories that this person could get from their protein. So, 85 times 4, I got 340. So, for your answer for number 4, kind of starting off, is 340 kcals will come from this patient's protein, okay? Now, we're gonna calculate non-protein calories, which means the overall calories we still need to get from everything but protein, all right? So to do that, for number five, simply take the target of the total daily energy expenditure, the total of calories they need per day, which was the 2014, subtract the amount they're getting from protein. So what they're not getting from protein has to come from non-protein sources, all right? So if you subtract the 340 from the 2014, I got 1,674. The reason that's an important number now, that's the number that we're going to get from two sources. What did we say there are two other sources of calories are going to be? Dextrose and fat oils, right? So the two of those together have to total this 1674. The next step is to try to figure out how much is going to come from which, all right? But the intermediate step for number six is this. Okay, before you do the actual dextrose, we need to make sure we don't kill the patient by over swapping their liver, right? Remember we said the liver is very important to managing this, this carbohydrate and the dextrose. Let's calculate a safety value. What is the safety limit, the ceiling to the amount of dextrose this person should get per day? So we start off by taking that value of 7.2 grams per kilogram per day. That's the limit. Multiply that by their weight. Their feet weight is 77. So 77 kilograms times at 7.2, what you can see is per day, the maximum this person can get of dextrose is 554 grams. Okay, but it's not super helpful. I want, I want to speak it in terms of calories. So let's convert the 554 grams calories by simply multiplying by the fact that you get 3.4 kilocalories per gram per dextrose. Doing that math, did you get 1,884? So that's not our target. That's not what we want to give. That's the what? The absolute limit. We have to be below that. So in our next step, when we actually calculate how much extra to give, this is the value we need to make sure we stay below. Okay, so it's just important that we have that limit before we then actually try to calculate how much extra to be used. So is everyone okay with kind of number six on your work? That's where the 1884 comes from is our max calories from extra. All right, now we can actually determine the breakdown between how much of this, this 1674 we talked about, how much comes from dextrose, how much comes from fat. And here's the deal, there's just ideal formulations, right? Are you supposed to have a high fat diet or a low fat diet? Low fat, right? So if you think about that, so when we talk about we want to get most of it from dextrose, but some of it from fat, on average 70 to 80 from carbohydrates, meaning 20 to 30 from fat is a good healthy diet, if you will, proportion. So those are ranges that are not particularly helpful. Let's just go in the middle of the range. So for my, for what I want you to do on your worksheet in terms of this calculation, let's say, okay, from those things, let's do 75% of our calories from dextrose, 25% from fat. Let's proportion the 1674 so that 75% comes from dextrose, 25% comes from fat, and then check to make sure those are safe, right? They might need to move. I mean, this is why we calculated that ceiling and so forth. Let's do an initial proportion. And then look at those numbers to make sure that. Probably 
do that in a second. My new worksheet. Not difficult, but remember, our total in this case is the MPC. We got to remember we have some calories already from protein, so our target here is the 1674. That's what needs to be 75% of which being dextrose, and 25% of the 1674 needs to be the fat. So if I do those, I get 1256 takeouts from dextrose and 418 takeouts from fat. And that's good. So let's double check. What did we say the ceiling for the dextrose was? 1884, right? Are we less than that? Yeah. So this is good. We can keep our standard formulation here. And we'll talk about this a little bit later as well. From fat, we do want to make sure. We, if we had to lower the dextrose because of the ceiling, well, the rest of those calories would come from one. If dextrose goes down, fat goes up. Does that make sense? So we want to make sure that our fat concentration never gets higher than 60%. So if we have to lower dextrose, we want to make sure that fat doesn't go over 60% because that can cause pancreatitis and really limit the ability of the body to break down all that fat. So anyways, 75, 25, that works for us given those values, so we're good. So is everyone down with number seven? We now have everything we need to do to start calculating volume. You are ready now to actually determine how much of which fluid to put into the bag. Let's actually make this one. We know what we need to know. So if you scroll, make sure you scroll down to the next page, if you will. We're about ready to start with that, but here's the way. Stop. And we're about to make volume. We're right? going to make this one. You have to ask yourself, which hospital are we in? What equipment do we have to actually measure the volumes that we're going to calculate? It makes a difference in how we're now going to formulate and then calculate our volume. Remember the two methods they talked about in the video was, if you're at the KU Medical Center, has a lot of patients doing a lot of surgeries, and you're going to provide your own TPMs in a large amount every day, what are you going to buy? All that fancy pump equipment. Remember all those pumps that were in the hoods and everything else? What do they call those generically? A computerized pump is an ACD. What does that stand for? Automated compounding device. So speaking of them generically, an ACD is what I call the pump method. You're going to use these computerized pumps to pump all the volumes that you want. They talk about how that's a very simple way. You tell whatever volume. Whatever volume you want, it can pump. So you are unlimited in what volumes you choose based on this patient's need. And it pumps it for you. That's great. What's the downside? $100,000 worth of equipment. All right? It is an expensive way. You're not going to invest in that if you're not going to make but one TPN a week or a day or maybe even a month. Does that make sense? So there are plenty of hospitals, especially in rural Kansas, that you may end up with that may. Here's the deal. If you're a small hospital, not going to invest in that amount of money. There's two ways to make the TPN. One is to call somebody on the phone and tell them to make it and mail it to you, right? So there are a lot of outsourced VPN sources, and that's great. Right. A lot of hospitals still do that. But you're going to see here in a minute this preset volume method, which is the same as the gravity fill method they talked about in the video. All it requires is gravity. Do most pharmacies have gravity? Yes, every single part. All I get is hold a bottle here and it, and it fills the bag down below, kind of showed you in the video. So you can make these without any actual equipment. And you'll see here in a little bit. In this other method, which is a little more difficult for you guys to kind of grasp at first. But once you get it, it allows you to quickly make TPM. It doesn't feel like it's a while, but you don't have to have fancy equipment. So you really can make these either way. In this case, what we're doing right now, and you're on the, hopefully on the worksheet that says the pump method, we're doing the pump method to begin with. So right now, let's assume we're going to be in the KU Medical Center where we've got all this fancy equipment. So how are we going to formulate this? When you have the pump method, you make, it's also called a three in one. Means the one big bag. Three means the fat, the protein, and the dextrose is all in the same bag. Everything is in the bag. This ginormous two to three liter bag that's always white because it's got the fat emulsion provides everything for a what? How, how many hours? 24 hours. So 24 hours supply of everything they need in this one bag. That's what we are making. Okay? So, what's important that you understand is that this pump can pump in fluids. And you tell it so, okay, so that doesn't make a lot of sense. But what I'm trying to get at this, let's look at this part right here. You tell it how much you need. So, for example, the first stop there says 350 milliliters, right? So I program that in. The machine will pump fluid out of the bag and into your empty bag. How does it know when to stop? How does it actually measure the volume it has pumped into the bag? I want to make sure you understand this, just in terms of how these devices work. Not only did we tell it, the volume, but we also gave it the what? What is this number below there? You remember what I talked about in the video? The specific gravity. What you don't understand is that this bag is put on a highly sensitive digital balance. That metal pan that they showed you, you kind of see it. We see here, here, this pan right here. That's a digital scale. So you put an empty bag on there, it essentially pairs it. 
You say 350 mils, but it knows the specific gravity, so it starts pumping and it starts weighing. And when it weighs the correct amount, it turns off the pump. So remember, the specific gravity is extremely important because that's how the machine actually does it. So what do you think is 570 mils of which ingredient is? Given that the specific gravity is what? One? That's the water. So that's the sterile water. So realize that's how the machines know and actually pump out. I want you to see this because weight is really important in terms of how it knows it's accurate. Last little short video, I wanted you to kind of see how the one version of it, I guess I didn't say this. There's more than one company. Baxter makes an Xactimix, which is kind of really common. Then Braun makes one called Pinnacle, and they do the same thing. And you can kind of see. You've got big base solution bottles here. There's the fat wash over here. All the electrolytes we haven't talked about yet are in the middle here, and it basically pumps all that stuff in there. So let's just kind of quickly just see or kind of see how that process works a little bit more up close. In the order entry software, a patient order or .pat file is created. This contains the patient information and the formula to be pumped. A corresponding label with a barcode may also be printed at the same time. Typically, a technician applies this label to a new patient bag and brings the bag to the compounder. This will depend on your facility's protocols. At this point, Attach the patient bag to the load cell using aseptic technique. Once it is on the load cell, scan the barcode on the label. The compounder will retrieve the formula information for this patient from the .pat file and populate the pump screen on the compounder. All those squares are what if the formula it, includes an ingredient it. that must be added manually, a manual add button appears on the left side of the pump screen. Tap this button to view information about the ingredients that must be added manually. To begin the compounding process, tap Run. A message appears asking you to select the size of the bag attached. Select the size of the bag and tap OK. At the pump screen, the Run button becomes a Pause button. The compounder pumps the ordered volume of each ingredient, one at a time, into the patient bag in the specified sequence. When an ingredient is being pumped, its button becomes yellow. The compounder will weigh any ingredient delivered over 100 milliliters as well as the final bag. If you need to pause compounding temporarily, you can perform either of the following actions. Tap pause, then tap resume to start compounding again, or open the pump door, then close the pump door and tap resume to start compounding again. The mix check report will indicate that compounding was stopped. When compounding is finished, a message displays this information about the patient bag, expected weight, actual weight, difference, whether or not the difference is acceptable. If acceptable, tap OK. A record of the transaction will print in the mix check report. So remember, a lot of that's computer organized. It, it talked about the order of mixing as well. Some, some ingredients, remember, we want calcium separated from phosphate, so that there's calcium well before the phosphate. How does it clean things in between? Remember that it's going to need some sterile water, too, for the final wine, so it uses some of the sterile water between each of the ingredients to clear the things and so forth. So it's kind of a nicely organized system. So anyways, but here's the deal. So it can pump whatever volume you want. But here's the deal. You've got to tell it what concentration you want it to pump, remember? What's important you kind of see here is that amino acids we talked about protein. You could have the three, you could have, have 3.5 all the way up to 15, right? Look at all the different bags you could pump from. So there are five different concentrations of amino acids. There are five or six, six different concentrations of dextrose, ranging from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 70 percent. Which one do you want to pump? Would you agree the volume will differ depending on what concentration you're using? It can pump whichever one you want to get out of tell it. You have to choose, the same thing with, with the lipids here in a little bit, you'll see you have three different concentrations, 10, 20, or 30 percent. So in the pump method, what I'm trying to say is, you've got to tell it which of the ones that you're pumping from. The volume will depend on it. Just choose. Well, what we're going to do here in a little bit, we're going to choose to use the 15 percent amino acid, the 70 percent dextrose, and the 20 percent fat emulsion. What is common for most of those? The higher concentration. What is the advantage of pumping a higher concentration? What is the volume? Then? Smaller volume. So the higher the concentration, the less of it you need, less often you have to replace the bag. Remember how they talk about pausing and opening the door? Because when the damn thing runs out, you gotta change the bag and start a new bag again. The less of those supplies you have to use, the quicker and easier it generally is to pump all that stuff. 
So anyway, but it doesn't matter. You can use for whatever reason, whatever concentration you want. But we have chosen 15% amino acids, 70% dextrose, 20% fat emulsion. All right. So we're about ready to go to number eight on your worksheet. Uh -huh. Last check for TPM volume. Remember how we said we calculated 2,400 milliliters for the total daily fluid use. Before you commit to that, this is where you want to stop to make sure. All right. But is there any other fluid or reasons to reduce that amount? Are they volume overloaded already? Are they, do they have edema and so forth? What I did mention before is what about other IV fluids? Do you think somebody having surgery is given an IV antibiotic? I guarantee you they're getting an IV antibiotic. So aren't they getting some of their fluids from that IV? Do you have to account for that for a milliliter per milliliter basis? The answer is no. What you do at this point is decide. Are they getting a lot of fluid from IV? And a lot is a line in the sand, but most places will choose about a liter. So 1,000 milliliters. If they're giving 1,000 milliliters or more, then yeah, we've got to reduce our TPM volume. Think about this. Say he's getting an IV antibiotic even four times a day. What are most piggybacks that intermittent therapy volumes use? 50, 100, even as high as 150? What is 150 times four? And you see where well, that's still going to be less than 1,000 milliliters. So oftentimes, intermittent therapies, that volume of the fluid, you don't have to worry about. There are some people on continuous infusions for heart medicines, things like that. They can get a lot of fluid if something's infusing continuously. So yes, we need to look at their other IVs to decide whether or not we got the limit the total fluid volume. Our patient, we don't have to worry about that. So we're going to say, all right, so not getting a lot of fluid from anywhere else. Let's give them 2,400 mils for this DPM. So with that, then we can start with our protein volume. So number eight, pretty straightforward, right? These are just math calculations. You know what your target is, our protein target 85 grams. What concentration did we choose to use? 15%. That's 15% weight per volume. That means 15 grams per 100 milliliters. So do the math however you want. I'll show you how I do my math up there. You have to see, I always do it using dimensional analysis so you can see how the units cancel. But you can do that math however you want. It's pretty straightforward. Basically, 85 grams divided by 15%, or times 100 divided by 15, so that units cancel. What do you get? I got 567 mils. Let me always check my answer, but please take a minute to try to do it. If I say something you don't understand, you're going to have to do this on your own here in a little bit. So, again, if I say things not clearly, please ask. Okay. 85 grams divided by 0.15, or essentially, you know, divided by 15%, gives 567 milliliters. Okay. Well, that's your big answer for number eight. That's our volume for number eight. Volume for dextrose for number nine is a little more complicated. There's one more step because our target is in kcal, right? So what I want is 1,256 kilocalories. So your first step is to convert the kilocalories back to grams. And remember, we said for dextrose for carbohydrates, you get 3.4 kilocalories per gram. So take the 1,256 kilocalories and times it by for every one gram, there's 3.4 kcal. So divide by 3.4 and you convert kcal to grams. Then you can convert grams to mils, just like what we did for the protein. Either divide by 70% or divide by 0.7, or times it by 100, divided by 70, so that you can see how the units cancel. And in the end, you should be able to calculate the volume. Do the math. But you see where there's an extra step. We've got to go from our target in kilocalories and convert kilocalories to grams, and then convert grams to mils using the concentration we chose. We chose 70%, so that's why we're doing the 70%. That number comes from. In the end, I think I got 527 milliliters. So that's our volume for number nine. Do the same thing for the fat. It works the same way. Again, our target was in KCALS 418. But be careful with this. It's fat now, right? It's not extra. So we have to use a conversion of 10 KCALS per gram for fat. So that's why I'm going to divide the 418 KCALS by 10 to convert KCALS to grams of fat. Then, which, which concentration we choose to use? 20%. So divide by 20%, divide by 0 0.2, times 100 over 20, however you want to do it, and convert that though from kcals to grams, grams to mils. Okay, let's be careful with the conversions from kcals to grams. They are different for each, for each metabolic source. I got 209 milliliters. So we have our volumes now for eight, nine, and ten. 
So those are all our macronutrient volumes. We know in this PPM volume wise, how many mils of 15%? We're gonna infuse 557 mils of 15% amino acid, 527 mils of B70, and 209 mils of 20% panel. Do we know the amount of sterile water yet? No, but that's the, that's the one major solution we do at the very end because we need to account for all of our electrolyte volumes. We've got the three main sources of fluid now already calculated. So, are you ready to make a mental shift? Now we got to go from macronutrients down to micronutrients. So now we're going to go to the electrolytes. So you should be looking at that big long table on your worksheet. You'll notice on the left hand side a list of all the different uh, electrolytes on top. Don't worry about the multivitamins trace elements yet, but really just the sodium down to potassium. Here's the deal: most people need the same amount. Okay, so there's a standard range. What you show there on your worksheet for each of those under your target range is the low end and the high end. So here's what you need to know. The range there is not patient specific. It's the amount that people need per what? It's the milliequivalents per liter. So that's not a patient specific. So what you've got, as you see on your worksheet, we've got to take your target range and make it patient specific by multiplying by their TPM volume in the units of liters. Well, how many liters will this PPM volume be? It's 2,400 milliliters divided by 1,000 is 2.4 liters. So in that big box on your worksheet where it says PPM volume, put a big old 2.4 liters in there. Because then what you've got to do is now multiply the low end and the high end of each electrolyte by 2.4. Make a patient-specific range under adjusted range. So point to the adjusted range on your worksheet is the range to choose from specific for this patient. You see where things would go really wrong if you did not adjust it by the volume that this patient's actually getting in liters. So multiply low end by 2.4, then the high end by 2.4. You can check your answers up here as you do it. Do at least a couple of them on your own, and then you can check to see if I got, you got my answers. It's not, not my ready, but understand why you're doing it. In important math, take a generalized range for liter and making the patient specific because this patient is getting 2.4 liters. Now we have the range to choose more appropriately from. And we'll do that here in a minute when we choose the amount. Keep working on your adjusted range. Now, as we're having people finish up with that, let's go to the next home over where it says amount. The amount is really choose from that range. There are no rights and wrongs, choose from the range. Well, this is where, again, clinical status would be important. You would look at their lab value. What is their current sodium, their so your plasma sodium? What about potassium levels, calcium levels? There, is there any reason to go high on the range or low on the range? So there is clinical status that can help guide where you're in this range to choose from. Okay? Without that, here's the other thing I want you to just realize. You know, pharmacists are practical people. Okay? Even though you're pumping things, it would be much more accurate to pump four milliliters than 3.92 states. Do you agree? There's no reason why you have to make it more difficult. So let's look at my value for sodium, 72. Right? That is, first of all, is it in the range? Not right or wrong, as long as it's in the range. But you know what I did a little bit? I look, look below your table on the left hand side. Do you see where it says additive concentration? That's the concentration of the actual ingredient that you're going to pump in to provide sodium. So what is the uh, ingredient that will provide sodium? Sodium chloride. What is its concentration? It's four MEQs per mil. Do you see that below your table there? So it would be useful to choose a number within the range that's divisible by what? Four. Divisible by four, it'll just make your life easier. You look under you know, the rest of those, you'll see that. So in the end, you can just write down my amounts to give. So fill out your uh, amounts as my amounts to give. But as you're writing down my 72, my 33, the 16, and so forth, Look at those numbers under the concentration. I tried to be a little practical and choose within the range a number that was divisible by that concentration. It will just make your life easier from a practical standpoint. Okay. So does everyone have everything but the last column over there on the far right where it says volume filled out? So we've done everything except for actually calculate the volumes of our ads. We've calculated the patient specific range and chose the value from within that range and made a, a practical value within that range. Okay. Now, before we move on, you think, okay, the next step is to calculate that volume, that last column, but we gotta do a check. If we chose wrong, I wanna calculate a volume and then figure out that's not the right amount to use. Let's do the chalk test, because the only other thing we gotta be concerned about is, did I choose a calcium and a phosphate that's safe to give together in terms of the amount? 
right? So here's the deal. What what is the amount of calcium that we added? Our, our amount, our selected was 13 what? What are the units though? Milliequivalents, right? 13 milliequivalents, that's fine. But for phosphate, here's what I'm getting at. The phosphate is expressed in millimoles. So you're 33. Did you all have 33 under the amount for phosphorus? That's 33 millimolar. It's not milliequivalents. But our target is 45 milliequivalents per liter. So we have to convert 33 millimolars to milliequivalents. Right. Do you remember how to do that? You multiply millimoles by what? Valence. Remember, milliequivalence is electricity, it's charge, whereas moles, millimoles are molecules. You know, I guess some of you are going back to chemistry or not here to the table. But anyway, so all we're going to do is multiply 33 millimoles by the valence per phosphate. The problem is, it's not quite that easy because the commercial product, potassium phosphate, is a mixture of both dibasic and monobasic. Monobasic has a positive. Two, or I should say, have a negative two charge. The dibasic has a negative one charge, and you'll notice it's about in a one-to-one -one mixture. It's not exactly so. Would you agree? About half is the monobasic, the other half is the dibasic. So here's the deal. Let's take an average. If one of them is a negative two and the other one is a negative one, what is negative two plus negative one? Negative three. Divide that by two. What is the average? One point five. Degrees. So what we're going to do is multiply our millimoles by 1.5 valence as an average valence to convert to milliequivalents. That's the whole point. If you don't care about any of that, just multiply by 1.5. I tried to explain where it came from, but that's why we're going to convert 33 times 1.5 to go from millimoles to milliequivalents. So I would argue 33 times 1.5 is 49.5. Add to that then the 13 milliequivalents of potassium. Calcium, sorry, and that gives us 62.5. And is 62.5 larger than 45? If it is, that's a problem. Would you agree it is? Oh, wait a minute. It's 45 ml equivalents per what? Per liter. What is the volume of our TV? So this 62.9 or 62.5 ml equivalents is the total, but it's in a total volume of what? 2.4 liters. So we need to divide the 62.5 by 2.4 to see what our total is per liter. And I would argue that divided by 2.4 gives us 26 milliequivalents per liter, which is safe since it's below the 45. Everyone okay to see where that came from? I'm going to make it more difficult, but remember you've got to convert to milliequivalents, then add the two together, then divide by the total volume in liters. And in this case, we're good. All right, let's do the volume. And I want you to do right now, on your own, do quickly the sodium, phosphorus, magnesium, calcium. Do not do potassium, I'll explain why here in a little bit. But calculate the volume for each of those ingredients based off of the concentrations on your worksheet. I know I have shown you my math up there, and you can just say, yeah, that makes sense, but try it on your own. Make sure you can do this. Take the total, or target, and just divide it by the concentration. And so for like sodium, if our total is 72, Take 72 divided by 4 milliequivalents per mil. That would convert it to milliliters. And you can fill that in. So I'll give you a moment and try to do sodium, phosphorus, magnesium, calcium. Come back to the test. That seems the trick. So the others are not. So practice your math and make sure you can easily calculate the volume of each of those first four additives. Hopefully, everyone get 18 milliliters and 11, 4, 28. Any questions on that? It's pretty good. Hopefully it's pretty easy. Now, let's deal with the potassium. So here's the deal. And remember this. And this is more because this question I've had when you work on your own this, it always comes down to potassium. This is pretty good. You want to do the phosphorus first because there's only one additive that provides your source of phosphate or phosphorus. Okay? What is the name of the ingredient that provides the phosphate? Potassium phosphate, right? So Potassium phosphate, that ingredient, is based off of the target for phosphate. So did you take the target? What was our target for phosphate? Phosphorus, I always use those interchangeably. Yeah. 33 milliequivalents, right? I divided it by the concentration of phosphorus in that product, which on your worksheet was what? Three millimoles per milliliter of phosphorus. So 33 divided by three millimoles per milliliter gave me 11 milliliters. So is everyone okay with where this came from? That's pretty straightforward, but it's for the phosphorus, and that's why we're going to use that amount of potassium phosphate. Okay? 
Is there any potassium in potassium phosphate? Yes. So would you agree that 11 milliliters provides exactly the amount of phosphate that I need? But do we know how much potassium it provides too? Wow, let's do that. That's why the first thing we're going to do on this calculation is to take that number down here and convert the milliliters of potassium phosphate to the milliequivalents of potassium provided by that. So look down on your ingredient list for potassium phosphate. Do I give you a concentration of potassium in potassium phosphate? Yeah, you see on your worksheet, I tell you there are 4.4 MEQs of potassium per milliliter. So if I think with that 11 milliliters times that, that's the number 48.4 MEQs of potassium will already be in my bag from the potassium phosphate. Is that okay conceptually? Make sure you can understand. You're using 11 mils to give you the right amount of phosphate, but that 11 mils will also provide you the 48.4 milliequivalents potassium. So now, the next step, as you can see up here on your worksheet, you see under potassium, where it says K plus MEQs minus. So let's start with this. What was our target for potassium? Our target total was what? I'm trying to get that on that worksheet. Is you're going to start with 84. You see where that came from in your on your worksheet. That was your target for potassium. So say 84. Subtract the number we just calculated. Subtract the amount from the potassium phosphate. So that was the 11 mils times the 4.4. That was the 48.4. So 84 minus 48.4 gives us the amount of potassium we still need. So this is the amount we need to get from something else. What is the other additive we're going to use for that? Potassium chloride. So what is the concentration of potassium chloride given for you? It says two MEQs per mil. So that's why this remaining amount down here is what I'm going to divide by two, essentially two MEQs per mil to convert from mill equivalents that I still need, the 35.6, to the volume of potassium chloride that will provide that, which is essentially 17.8. So my final answer under potassium on the far right, under volume, would be 17.8 milliliters. Because 17.8 milliliters of potassium chloride would provide 35.6 milliliters of potassium, which when added to the potassium in the potassium phosphate gives me the total I needed, which was 84. Okay, that's tricky. I get it. But, that, but the rest of those are pretty straightforward, right? But just remember, start with phosphate because the amount of potassium phosphate you use provides the phosphate. But then account for that potassium when you calculate for the potassium chloride. All right? Well, that's the tricky thing. Oh, I should go. So now, is there one question here? Yeah, please. Yeah, um, that 84, where, where did that come from? Again? The that's a good question. So look under the potassium on your worksheet. Do you see where the normal range is 30 to 40 on your worksheet? Mm -hmm. That's not, but that's not per liter. That's per liter, not for this patient. So then when we multiply the 30 and 40 by 2.4, look under your adjusted range. My adjusted range for potassium was 72 to 96. Okay. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Because that's just the range thing. We chose a number. 84 just came from the number we chose within that range. It could have been anything within that range. So that's where it came from. That was our choice. And that's what drives all this. Okay? Good. Everyone still alive in 3002? Look inside, don't answer that. All right, let's keep going because we're owing on our All right, so here's the deal. On your worksheet here, we got to get a total volume. So you see where it says total electrolyte volume in big old letters there. We need to add everything up. So add all of your electrolyte volumes that we've calculated. You'll also notice I threw in 10 milliliters for the multiple vitamin. I also threw in three milliliters for the trace elements, the minerals. So don't forget to include those. So add up all your electrolytes plus the 10 plus the three and give me a total for everything. And we're gonna need that number here in just a second. So I'll show you my math. You can see it up there, but do it yourself. See if you get my value. Everything was said and done, I got 91.8 milliliters for everything, from the electrolytes and the vitamins and all. We're done. Basically, we're done. So let's just do what this slide is, is number 11. So on your worksheet, the last thing we got to calculate is the water, because the sterile water for injection will be whatever volume is left that we still need for our total daily, right? So let's start in the big box where it says total PPM volume. That's what we said would be our total daily fluid needs. So that would be the 2,400 milliliters. In your box there on your worksheet, total PPM volume, so 2,400 milliliters. From that, then we're going to subtract the protein volume. Look above, protein volume is number eight. That should be your 567. 
What is the dextrose volume? That was your target number nine. Look on your worksheet for number nine. That was your 527. Minus the fat volume, which on your worksheet was number 10. That was 209 milliliters. Minus what we just calculated, and that's why we needed to calculate the total electrolyte volume, which was the 91.8. So if you subtract all of those from your total PPM, what do you get? 105, 1,005 milliliters is the amount of sterile water we need. So this slide just summarizes all of that. So again, the base solutions are top. So this is all the, I mean, the protein, the carbohydrates, the fat, and the water. And then we talk about the 91.8 mil for all those electrolytes and things. That's what makes it. Yeah. Lastly, the thing you're going to have to label for the, the nurse is the infusion rate. So let's calculate that quickly. The infusion rate will be the total volume of this TPM, which we said was how many mils? 2,400 mils, right? Divided by how many hours does it have to be infused over? Because it's to provide the amount of everything they need for how long? 24 hours or a full day. So 2,400 mils divided by 24. That's how I took that number. So Convenient gives you, I think, 100 milliliters per hour. That would be what you calculate to put on the label for the nurse. Any questions? We're done with the first worksheet. Uh, we got one more to do, so keep going to the next page or slide to the next page. Well, let's talk about what we're doing here. Uh, here's the deal. So, we said this patient was at the KU Medical Center and has been receiving this CPM just as you formulated it. Using this pump method, and we send up one bag for dinner, got that for a couple of days, but now they want to go home. So they're being transferred back home to Salina, Kansas, and maybe they're a newly regional hospital, and still need to be on a DVM. Okay? So does that make sense? Same patient, same needs. Would you agree? It's the same person, but now we're going to be at another hospital to try to prepare for him, and we don't have pumps. So we need to do this formulation. They need to put a different formulation because the way we're going to make it is very different. So I love the term, I they know that they use gravity field because it's gravity instead of a pump. You're going to see here in a minute. The better way to think about this method is a preset volume. Method. Because here's the deal. I'm a small hospital. I may be the only pharmacist there. I'm a busy man. I do not have time to measure volumes. That 567 mils of amino acids? Oh, hell no. That would take me forever with syringes to pull out that exact volume. I'm too busy for that. So guess what? In this method, you already know the volume of the amino acid. You know what the volume of the amino acid is? 500 milliliters. I already know the volume of the dextrose. It's 500 milliliters. Do you want to know why? Can anyone tell me why? That's the size the bottle comes in. I'm too busy to measure anything. I'm going to hold the bottle up and it's into the bag. I'm done. All right? I'm not measuring. I don't have time to measure nothing for the big solution. All right, then I do. So I'm going to use a 500 ml bottle of dextrose, I'm going to use a 500 ml bottle of amino acids, and I'm going to use a 500 ml bottle of, of fat emulsion. The volumes are not to worry about, because I'm just going to give a bottle. How can I make it patient specific? How can you possibly make it patient specific if the volumes are all the same for everybody? The volumes are the same, but for like amino acids, isn't they come in multiple concentrations? Aren't there like five different concentrations of amino acids? Where there's six different concentrations of dextrose and three different concentrations. So while I'm going to use a whole bottle, I can choose the concentration that best meets that patient's needs. So in the previous method, we took our targets and figured out the volume to use. In this method, we're going to take our targets and figure out the concentration to use because our volumes are fixed. Okay? Which is a little mind I know it's kind of difficult to understand, but you'll see here in a little bit. Okay, so optimal concentrations, not specific volumes. Lastly, picture this though. If you can picture one of them, two things. This method, in this method, we don't make a three in one. What did I say a three in one was? The big bag was everything fat emulsion, uh, protein, and carbohydrates. In this method, that fat emulsion, we will give them a 500 ml bottle of fat emulsion, but we're going to send it up to the floor to be administered separate. That makes sense. So they will get that volume and they will get those calories, but we're not mixing it in the TPM okay, with everything else. So a two-in-one means you've got your amino acids with your dextrose and all your electrolytes and everything else, but the two-in-one doesn't have what? The fat emulsion, okay? So they will get those calories and volume separately. So picture this. Do you already know what the volume of a TBN bag, so I'm talking TBN bag, is going to be 500 mils from the amino acids, 500 mils from the dextrose, and take my word on it now, about 50 mils for the electrolyte. That's 1,050 mils. Would one TBN bag be enough to last our patient? 
And even if you have the 500 mils from the fat, isn't that just like 1,500 mils? You see what I'm saying here? So in this method, you get more than one TPN per day. We're going to talk about calculating the number of bags per day. They need more than one bag per day. So that's a key thing that's different and it's weird now. We'll do that calculation in a minute. All right. Probably should have shown this up earlier, but this is what we do. To actually make these bags, you, make, you stick an empty bag here and you use gravity. That's why I'm showing you above. You hang a bag and it just drains into this. This drains into this. What, what forces the fluid from the bag to the empty bag? Gravity. You just hold it up high and the gravity pulls it in there. That's why they call it the gravity field method. But the dextrose and the amino acid are the only base solution into this bag. And into that bag go the electrolytes and the, and the, and the uh, trace elements. That's what I mean by a TPN bag. So everything but the fat emulsion. So that bag gets sent up and is infused. But we also send up a bag, if you will, or a bottle of the fat emulsion. So they will get 500 milliliters of the fat emulsion in the volume of calories, but then infused separately. It's not mixed into the bag. Okay? Trying to visualize, look at that drawing that was terrible. If you want to explain so much for my art skills. Are we good to go? So let's look at your worksheet. Now we know how we're going to make this. Well, let's just fill out the worksheet and then some things will come along. So on your worksheet, under targets one through four, have those changed for this patient? It's the same patient with the same feed plate with the same need. So copy all those numbers over. So flip back to your previous worksheet on the first page and write down what was the total daily fluid need? What was his protein requirements? How many grams of that stuff? So fill out. Give you a second to fill out one through four. That comes from your previous worksheet that we've already did for this patient. We don't need to redo those calculations. They still need the same thing. So we're kind of number one should be 2,400 milliliters. That was our total daily fluid. Protein, remember we wanted 85 grams. Number three, the total daily thing that we were doing was that the 2014 was the total daily salary. But that was split up so that we were doing 1256 from dextrose and 418 from fat. Everyone okay with one through four? Those same targets are going to drive our calculations. We're just going to meet those needs in a different way. Okay? So Let's go ahead and focus on your worksheet. I, I have some of this up here, but I think it's easier just to do the math on your worksheet. It'll walk you through what we need to do. Because number four is extremely important. It's new. We need to calculate the number of bags per day. So let's just do this one step at a time. So on your worksheet, where it says TPN volume per day, what was his total daily fluid need? 2,400 mils. Is he getting fluid from other sources? Is he volume overload? No, no. So your answer for TPN volume per day, let's still put our 2,400 mils. We're still going to say the total TPN volume per day needs to be 2,400 milliliters. Now to the right, where it says adjusted volume, subtract 500 from fat, for fat, I should say. And that's what we're going to do. They are going to get a 500 mil bottle of fat emulsion, but separately. So let's take it out of our TPN volume. Let's account for that volume and take it away from our TPN volume. So what is 2,400 minus 500? That should give you hopefully 1,900. So are we okay now saying that our TPN volume per day? Is 1,900 accounting for the fat. Go down to the next one. It's an hourly flow rate. This TPM volume, this 1,900 milliliters, is supposed to last for how many hours? 24 hours. So let's calculate the flow rate. Take the 1,900 milliliters, divide that by 24. Let's calculate milliliters per hour and round that to a whole number. So what did you get? Well, I took 1,900 and divided it by 24. Huh? 24. I got 79 milliliters per hour. Okay, for you guys. Okay. To the right of that is where you have to take me on my word here a little bit, where it says volume per bag. We know that now because I know the bag will consist of about 500 milliliters of amino acid, 500 milliliters of dextrose, and trust me on this, about 50 milliliters for the electrolytes. So go ahead and put 1,050 milliliters down for the volume per bag. Volume per bag is 1,015 milliliters. So last line, that's important. Time per bag is the volume of the bag divided by the flow rate. So if I take a 1,050 mil bag and I infuse that at 79 mils per hour, how many hours will it last? What is 1,050 divided by 79? That's the volume. Just picture a bag. And again, well, a minute. The volume divided by the 79, so I would argue that volume at that rate, 79, will last 13.3 hours. Okay. 
And bear with me, try to visualize this. So picture this picture. Nurse is in the bedside with a bag, a TPN bag, and a pump at midnight. So the nurse hangs the bag at exactly midnight and hits start on the pump. Okay, it starts pumping that bag out at 79 mils per hour. What time will that bag be empty? It lasts 13.3 hours, right? So wouldn't it be a little bit after 1 p.m.? So at one after 1 p.m. sometime, it's going to be empty. So how many bags per day do we actually need to send up to the floor? Two, right? Aren't they going to go through two? So we change the bag at one whatever it is in that afternoon and pump it at 79 miles per hour. Will we go through that entire second bag? So when we're going to send two bags up, they're not going to go through all two. So how many bags will they actually go through? So that's your last step. The last calculation you need to do is to take the 24 hours and divide it by 13.3. What is 24 divided by 13.3? And always keep the one decimal point. It just keeps some accuracy to this. So what is 24 divided by 13.3? Did you get 1.8? So going back to that second bag, how much, what percent of that second bag will they get before by midnight? 80%. So you're either getting 1.8 bags, which means you're getting 80%. So while we have to make two bags, all of their caloric requirements and everything they need has to be obtained by the time they've gotten 1.8 of those bags. So this 1.8 number, just kind of circle that on your worksheet. It's really important how we're going to adjust what goes into each bag. Because we need to put enough in there so that they get everything within 1.8 bags. Okay? So that's why that number, where that number comes from, and it's, you'll see how it's going to be used here in a second. Okay? Well, let's start with the straightforward one. Let's do protein. All right, so we're now at number six. I'm sorry, number five on your worksheet. So let's do this. How many grams per day of protein did we say this first one? What was their target for number two? 85. That was 85 grams per what? Bear with me. Per day. We need to change that to the grams of protein per bag. All right. So if we take 85 and divide it by 1.8 bags per day, the per day is canceled, and you can re express it in grams per bag. So what is 85 divided by 1.8 gives me numerically rounding to 47 grams, and that's the grams of protein per what? Per bag. That's my target per bag. I want 47. My target would be, if I could get exactly what I want, I'd get 47 grams in each bag. But here's the deal. I'm not going to measure volumes to get exactly that amount. So look at your worksheet. There are five different concentrations. Which concentration of amino acids would give me as close to 47 grams as I could possibly get? Would it be the 3.5%? Oh, no, that's terrible. It's only 17.5 grams. So do you see, do you see 10%? How much does 10% get? 10% of amino acid gives me 50 grams. That's pretty close, right? Because if I go down to 8.5, that goes to 42.5. That's I think it's let's choose the 10%. I think the closest we can get to 47 without maybe undercutting them too much would be the 10% amino acid. If I use the 10% amino acid bottle that comes with 500 ml, I will provide him 50 grams. So circle that. Did we come close? Yes. Did we do it exactly? No, there's some concessions with this. You'll see this in a minute, though. It's still a therapeutically equivalent PPM, but it isn't exactly what our targets want. Okay? So, your big answer for number five in the big box for just protein percent, it should be 10%. You should circle the 10%. Step six is important. Because now we've made a real choice. We need to do the actual calories provided from that real choice. So let's calculate the calories coming from our decision. So under protein calories, Start with the fact that that bottle has 50 grams. So we're going to start with 50 grams of protein times the 1.8 bags of that per day they're going to get, and then times the 4 kilocalories per gram per protein. So take 50 times the 1.8 times 4, and that is the actual calories from protein we will be providing this patient with our TP. We should get something close to 360 when we're done with that amount. Okay. We don't have to do anything with that number right now, but we're going to come back to that. That is the calories from the food. Right? Okay, so let's go forward to the dextrose. All right? So dextrose, the first thing, just to do our safety thing here, let's go ahead and calculate our max. We already calculated the max dextrose per day, didn't we? Remember that was the 
554 grams per day. So write that down, just from we did that already. Take 554 grams per day, that was our maximum dextrose. Let's calculate the maximum dextrose in grams per bag. But now let's take the 554 divided by 1.8. That would tell me the ceiling, the maximum. Don't choose above this amount of dextrose. So 554 divided by 1.8 gave me 307. 308. So everyone okay with that? That's not my target, but that's we just gotta make sure that our choice doesn't exceed that. So now let's figure out this is a little more complicated. We gotta figure out though how many grams per bag of dextrose we use. But we were starting with our target was in kilocalories. So let's start with our target, which was 1,256 kilocalories, right? Let's start with that. And then we've got to divide that by 3.4 to convert it to grams. Right, so 1,256 divided by 3.4 gives me my 369 grams per day, per day. And then I gotta convert that to grams per bag by dividing that by 1.8. So if I take 1,256 divided by 3.4 to convert to grams, and then divide by 1.8, I get it in grams per bag. So my target is 205 grams per bag. That would be what I would like to get. How close can you get to that? So let's look at the different concentrations I gave you down in your worksheet for 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, 70%, 70%, which is the best bag to use. To get close to 205, I would choose the 40%. You agree? Let's circle 40% on that. 40% gives us 200 grams. So that's real close, not exact, but it's real close. I don't want to jump way up to 250, and I certainly don't want to go all the way down to 150. The 40% is the best choice, I think, for the dextrose. So the big box for number seven, the 40%. Now let's calculate the calories from that actual choice. So number eight says, okay, you're going to choose the 40%. How many grams are you actually getting? 200. So let's take 200 grams. We're going to multiply that by the number of bags per day. So I'm getting 200 grams per bag. So 200 times 1.8 gives me the total grams per day. Then I can convert that to kilocalories by multiplying by the 3.4. So I convert my grams to kilocalories. Again, I show my work up on the slides. Hopefully, uh, see where I'm going with this. So we can pause here a little bit. And we do all that because I want you to kind of look at this number and compare it to this one. I'm sure you understand. Our overall target was 1256. And in terms of what I chose by not measuring any specific volume, but by choosing the best concentration that's closest to that, I can get within what? About 25 calories. You see how close you're getting without having to measure. But so by choosing the right concentration, you can provide nearly the same targeted amount of calories from dextrose. So in that sense, our actual, but in the end, what's important. So this number isn't really important anymore. This is the important. This is the important number because that is the actual number of calories we will provide. Okay, so let's move on to fat. That is the easiest calculation because we've already calculated everything else. So if our total target was the 2014, you remember our PBE total daily target was the 2014. Let's subtract the actual calories from protein, which we calculated under number six as 360. Subtract so for that our value we just calculated for number eight, which is the calories from dextrose, which we said was the 1224. What's less than is what we really need to try to get from fat. So if I take 2014 and subtract the 360, subtract the 1224, what's left over is 430. So look on your worksheet. Well, I mean, you gotta go, okay, so that was our target is 430. You can scroll to the top of the next page, if you will. Number 10. What are my choices? I have 10%, 20%, and 30%. I either get 550 or 1,000 or 1,500. So my choices are too much, way too much, or really do way, way too much. So what is the best choice? Too much. So circle the 10%. Because you can't not give them fat. They need fat. And I'm not measuring any volume. So I, the smallest, the least amount of calories I can give is the 500 mil bottle of the 10%. Okay? So I know now I'm going to use I'm going to use the 10% amino acids, the 40% dextrose, and I've now decided 10% fat. So number 11 is important. 
to kind of really understand what am I providing this person. So let's add up all of the calories. Now that I've made all of my three choices, under number 11, put down 360 ca calories from the protein. 360 from protein. It was 1224 from dextrose. And we now know it's 550 from fat. Even though that's more than I wanted, that is what I'm getting. It's 550. So add that all up. Let those all up, and that's where I got my 1,234 2, kilograms. This number right here. Did you all get that number? Okay. What was our target? Our target was this. So this is kind of an important number to compare. So we were off total. The total caloric difference by choosing those three different size bottles was essentially about 100, a little more than 100 calories. That's less than a Twinkie, man. So do you see where we are providing a therapeutically equivalent CPM? It may not be exactly the same, but it's darn close without measuring a single volume, okay? But let's do some safety checks. We still want to make sure our safety checks are there. Are we less than our maximum amount of dextrose for that? Remember, we're at 200 and our maximum is 308. So that's completely safe. The fat went way up though. Right? We only wanted 400 and some, and now we're providing 550. So let's double check our fat concentration. You won't want to overdo it. So on your worksheet, where it says verify percent from total calories from fat, let's take the calories from fat, which is 550, and divide that by the total now. The new total is the 2134, and express that as a percent. So 550 divided by 2134 times 100. I calculated that to be. 26%. So, would you agree from our optimal formula, which we wanted 25%, we have gone up to 26%. Is that still completely safe and acceptable value? Yeah. So, while we are overfeeding them by 100 and some calories, that's, that is certainly therapeutically just fine. Okay. That's all the base solution. I mean, we've done all the macronutrients. Are you guys ready to move on so you can get that all the Oh, there it is. All right. So, Summary, 10% amino acids, 40% dextrose, 10% fat emulsion, boom, 2,134 calories, and we're all good. So let's drive on to your worksheet and do the knock out these electrolytes. The good news, they work the same way. So on your sheet, look on your worksheet there. The patients still need the same range of electrolytes for what? For liter. So make sure in the big box, do you see where it says TPN volume on your sheet? What is the volume of your TPNs? Remember, we said they're right at 1,050 milliliters. So you need to put 1.05 liters as the specific patient specific volume in your box, because you're then going to need to multiply the low end and the high end, everything by 1.05. So on your worksheet, take the target range and convert it to an adjusted range by multiplying each number by 1.05. Is the volume in liters for this patient's TP. If you've done that, then we just need to choose within the range so that the second to the last column, the amount, is simply a number from within the middle of the range that we calculated that's patient specific. Use my numbers for now. And write those down. So there'll be amount to give, that'll be the amount. Double check me. A, they need to be in the range. Make sure that my amounts are within your range. They should be in the patient specific range. Ask yourself, is that divisible by the concentration? Will that make my life a little bit easier? And then lastly, don't look at the chalk test. Do your own chalk test, which I know is impossible since the numbers are up there, you can see it. Don't look. Try to calculate the chalk test. It's a little tricky, right? So use your worksheet, and once you write down the amounts, do the math and see if you can calculate those things for the, the chalk test. I'll just talk a little bit and give you some time to do that. So, before I move on, is everyone okay with where this column came from? And that this came from in there. All of these come from within that range. We had to make a patient specific range multiplying by our volume of the TPM, which is 1.05. And I just chose a number from within the range. It looks kind of convenient. You'll see here in Before we calculate the volumes, though, again, our calcium and our phosphate may not be right. It may not be a good combination. So let's do the chalk test. So I chose 15 millimolars of phosphate. Okay. Either millimolars to milli equivalents, I've got to multiply by 1.5. So 33 times 1.5 gave me the 22.5. That's in millicode, a phosphate. So 22.5 plus what I chose for calcium, which was 7.4, combines to the 29.9 millicodes combined, divided that by the volume in liters, which was 1.05. So I would argue my chalk test comes out at 28.5, which I would 
are you then is safe. You're all good for those two values. So now I can calculate my volume. So go ahead and do that. Okay, you can kind of write down my numbers over here under the summary, and I'll come to this here in a little bit if you're not completely. Let me talk through one of them. So hopefully the sodium, 32 was our target, divided by 4 meq per mil means we need 8 milliliters. So that's where the 8 milliliters is. Phosphate. Our only source of phosphate is from potassium phosphate. Since my target was 15, I divided it by 3. That's where the 5 milliliters comes from. Right? I need 5 milliliters of potassium phosphate to provide 15 millimolars of phosphate. But what I've got here, since that's the volume I'm going to use for potassium phosphate, that's the volume I'm going to use, I need to calculate the potassium from the potassium phosphate. So let me take 5 mil times the concentration of potassium in there, which was 4.4 MEQs per mil. 5 times that means I'm going to have 22 MEQs of potassium from the potassium phosphate. Does everyone know where the 37 came from? 37 was my target. That's how much potassium I want per day for this patient. Take the 37, subtract that 22. What's left is what I need to use from potassium chloride. So that's that target divided by the concentration of potassium chloride at 2 MEQ per mil means I need 7.5 mils of potassium chloride. So that's where that volume comes from. Okay? Now, add all of those up. So you'll notice on your worksheet for the total electrolyte volume for all of those numbers, I do not include vitamins and trace elements. I'll explain why here in a minute. Okay? So realize we we're not adding those to every single bath. So let's just add up the total electrolyte volume for without those means we have 38.5 total volume for electrolytes. Everyone okay with that? So now let's look on your worksheet because I think it's, I, it didn't match up perfectly. So let's fill out your worksheet. Summary, we're almost done. Each TPN bag will consist of 500 milliliters of what concentration of amino acid did we choose? Look back up there on your own thing, you can eat 10%, so put in 10% for that. And 500 mils of which dextrose? 40%. Those were choices that we've already made, so it was 10% amino acid and 40% dextrose. So that's 500 plus 500. Would you agree with that? Looking at your worksheet, certainly. Then below that, what did we just calculate for the total volume for electrolytes? 38.5, sorry, 38.5 down there. So add all that up. Well, that's not a hard, 500 plus 500 plus 38.5. The next line down, the total TPN volume per bag is 1,038.5. Okay, that's each bag will have that amount. Well, guess what we're going to do to one of those bags each day? To one of those bags, we're going to add 10 mils of vitamin and 3 mils of trace elements. Would you agree it would be bad to do that to all both or every bag because that would overdose them on this? So we're going to only add it to one. So you notice on that line, oh, I got ahead of myself. See, I always do this. I'm sorry. So let's go back to the worksheet. The 1038.5 to the right, that's per bag. Let's times that how many bags per day? And 1.8. So we just talked about total fluid from the TPN. Total. 1.8 times 1038.5, I got 1869. Everyone okay? I may have messed you up there. So under the total TPN volume, we multiply by 1.8, I get 1,869. That's the total that we're going to add 13 mils to, and then add 500 mils of the what concentration of animals did we choose? 10%. So we're choosing the 10% of animals. So would you agree we have 1,869 mils of fluid from our TPN bag? Then we're going to add 13 mils of vitamin and trace elements plus 500 mils of fat emulsion for a grand total of what did you get for the total daily fluid volume? Everything. So the only fluid, everything they're getting per day, you have everything, is 2,382. Did you get that by taking the 1869 plus 13 plus 500? Okay. What was our target? Our total daily target was 2,400. Are we there exactly? No? Are we close? Yes, we're pretty close. Our actual volume will be the 2382 total over there. Lastly, let's calculate an infusion rate for the TPN. Remember, the TPN is just the TPN, just the protein, the, the, the dextrose, and the electrolytes. So let's start with just the volume per bag. So the infusion rate for that bag will be the volume per bag, which is 1038.5, times the 1.8 of those per day. So if you want to 1.8 today. 
And then remember to add the 13 mils that will be put into one of those batteries. So that's all of the volumes for PBM. So the volumes times 1 plus 8 plus 13, divide that by 24, and round to the whole number. I got 78. 78. Do you remember, if you actually look through your worksheet back up to the where we calculated the number of bags per day, do you remember where we estimated and got 79? So do you see we estimated 79 and our actual is right at 78. That's it. That's how we formulated our made our completely therapeutically equivalent fact. Okay. Would you agree between the preset volume method and the pump method, which one is probably easier to fit the comment? The pump method, would you agree? You just put in the numbers, it does it, and you're done. It's definitely easier. Is there any easier way to make a TPM than the pump method? Uh, it could be, it was a of them. So I'm going to show you here this quick video on this commercial product that's now available in like five different ranges of volume and, and components here. That, and I want you to watch this to see if this would not be an easier way to make this DPS. Okay. The other reason I like, kind of like to end with this is let's see if you understand. They're going to use terms, and there are how many chambers? There are three chambers. What are in the different chambers? You know what I'm saying? I want you to see if it makes complete sense now after what we've talked about. And, not, and ask yourself too, this this would be a damn easy way to make a TPM. So. The Cabovin three chamber bag is an innovative and simple way to provide parental nutrition. Cabovin for central administration is available in four sizes, ranging from approximately one to 2.5 liters. The inner bag is composed of three chambers containing a lipid emulsion, an amino acid solution with electrolytes, and dextrose. The chambers are separated by one horizontal and two vertical seals to enhance stability for a longer shelf life. Each port is clearly labeled indicating its function. The chamber on the left should be white and the other two chambers should be clear and colorless. Place the bag on a clean, flat surface. To open the overpouch, locate the notches close to the ports and tear open. Remove and discard the overpouch and the oxygen absorber. Instructions to guide you through the activation steps are located on the white lipid chamber. With the text side up and the ports pointing away from you, roll tightly from the top of the bag, pushing the liquid down towards the ports until both vertical seals break. It may take up to five seconds of applying pressure to break the seals. The vertical seals must be broken from the bend down to the ports. The upper section of the vertical seals and the horizontal seal may remain unbroken. Mix the contents thoroughly by inverting the bag at least three times. Inspect the bag to confirm complete activation. An activated bag has vertical seals broken from the bend to the ports and contains a white homogeneous mixture in a single large chamber. Additions such as trace elements, vitamins, and electrolytes may be required. It is recommended that these additions are made after the bag has been activated and the contents of the three chambers have been thoroughly mixed. Does it make sense why it has three chambers? It's a three in one, right? The white chamber is the bad emulsion. You have the one that's dextrose and one that's amino acid. You just squish and roll it up and it pops and it all mixes together. But does it have any electrolytes or anything in it? No, so you have the electrolytes, the vitamins, and through the injection port. So would you agree that's probably an easier way than anything to be able to do that? So these are becoming a lot more popular, especially than maybe having to do maybe the mail order type thing. So, all right, you want to get out of here, you got to do one thing. You got to finish this patient. So patient number one here, you've got in your packet there on those worksheets, the next two, there are two more sets of worksheets, one for the pump method, one for the preset volume method. So this is the patient you're going to have to do that you're going to submit online. 
The only thing I want to finish to do together is let's come up with the same feed weight, just so that your numbers are somewhat close together. So let's do this. So on your worksheet for the pump method, so go on your work thing on that top line above there. Let's do, uh, I'll read this patient information. So let's come up with the feed weight together. So we're doing the feed weight for this patient. So write this down as I read it, fill in the little blanks for yourself. This is an 85-year-old female patient with intestinal obstruction being admitted to the hospital. She's been experiencing nausea and vomiting for a couple of days, along with some severe abdominal pain. The standard treatment for this is called ileus, which is just bowel. Something's blocking, if it's blocked in there, right? So let's just let it take care of itself. We don't really want to do surgery or force it out or anything, so let's not put any more food in so it doesn't get worse and let the body take care of itself. So that may take a couple of days. We don't want her to starve to death. Let's put her on a short term CPA. So that's the reason behind that. She stands five feet, two inches in height and weighs 160 pounds. Okay? I'll remind you there are 2.2 pounds per kilogram. So go ahead and complete, if you would, the, the, top, the first two lines. So calculate her height in centimeters and calculate her. Actual for ideal, the 120 and the adjusted. And then I'll give you a second and we'll talk about what to choose for the feed weight. So at least everyone's numbers will be based off the same feed weight. So let's see your height. I got, you know, 5 by 2, I got 62 inches. 62 inches times 2.54 centimeters. Did you get 157.5 centimeters? 157.5 centimeters. Her actual body weight in kilogram, I took 160 divided by 2.2, did you get like 73? 73 is her actual. When you calculated her ideal, did you use the right gender formula? Be careful with that. I got 50.1. Her ideal body weight was 6.1. Multiply it by 1.2 for 120 that's 60.1. So is her actual body weight below ideal in the range or above 120%? I would argue it's kind of above the 120%, so that's why let's use her, let's see, adjusted body weight I calculated at 55.8, we are 55.8, let's round that to 56, so just to make life a little bit easier, so let's use a feed weight of 56 kilograms, if you will, so that's going to affect all of your calculations and all of it. My last thing is let's look at the lab values up here. Clinical considerations is what about her renal function? So find her serum creatinine on there. That means 0 0.7, is that well within the normal range? That's pretty low for an 85 year old, so I don't think you need to worry too much about calculating a correcting clearance. I think the renal function is okay. There is a red number. Red numbers are bad generally on lab reports. So what came back red? Or albumin. So remember we said albumin, that big protein in the blood, it could definitely throw some things off here. It's not terribly, terribly low, but it's definitely 2.7 is below 3.5. So I guess the question is, what about her calcium? What is her calcium? Her calcium is 8.3. Isn't that below the recommended range? So should we give her some extra calcium? You see where the 8.3, I, I, 8.3, I would maybe go higher in the range for the calcium, except for that calcium is bound to albumin, right? Maybe with a low albumin, the calcium level is actually higher than that 8.3 that comes up on the lab report. So let's go ahead and calculate. I gave you the formula up there on the screen. Do me a favor, it's a quick calculation. What would be a corrected calcium balance? So we take the current 8.3 and add to it how much? 4 minus the current serum albumin times 0 0.8. So 80% of the difference between 4 and the current serum albumin. What did you get? And this is supposed to be the adjusted calcium balance. So instead of 8.3, when we go to interpret, when I did this math, did you get a, a 9.34? So I would say that a more realistic calcium value for her is 9.34. Is that still within the range? It's within the range, right? But it's not low in the range. So I say just go ahead and give her a normal calcium supplementation. You don't really need to worry about doing anything extra because of that low serum. Okay. So with that now, just work on this. And help each other, talk to each other. I know it's a socially thing is kind of weird, but you're welcome. It's not a test or anything else. You can work, compare answers. I will stay here until the last person leaves, so I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be going between the two classrooms. My job is to help answer questions, but I know it's a little awkward in this situation, so what I want you to do in the end, fill all of this out on the worksheets, because the worksheets will tell you what to do and how to do it. 